Hey YouTube, how you doing? Thanks for stopping by. This is Matthew of the Counselor's Guild and today I'll be doing uh, another classic psych review. I'll be looking at Eric Erickson's Psychosocial Stages of Development. First, a little background information on Erickson. Um, Eric Homberger Erickson, he was born Eric Salomonson uh, on June 15, 1902 um, in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, Eric Erickson is a developmental psychologist and psychoanalyst most known for his theory of psychosocial development of human beings, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, it's a little fact. This is actually um, uh, something his daughter said about Erickson. Um, Eric Erickson established his real psychoanalytic identity when he replaced his stepfather's surname of Hamburger to that of his own invention, Erickson. Uh, Erickson is credited with being one of the originators of ego psychology, which stresses the role of the ego as being more than just a servant to the id. He specialized in child analyst and underwent training with Anna Freud. He received a diploma from the Vienna Psyche Psychoanalytic Institute in 1933. Okay. Now before we get into the stage of the development, we have to talk about ego identity. This is what we're developing. This is the state. what the stages are for. Um, so I'm going to talk about my definition, and then I'll get into Erickson's uh, definition. Um, if you're interested, everything I have in this, um, in this presentation is from this book, Identity, um, Youth in Crisis. So look for that, but also, I mean, if you want to get, like, his whole, like, works... Um, you can look at the look for that one too. So just to let you know, a, a lot of this is from Erickson's books. It's it's not something I'm just uh, uh, creating myself. Um, but my my interpretation uh, about ego identity, uh, I'll, I'll say this: ego identity gives the individual the ability to experience who they are and how to act in a way that has continuity and sameness. There's no discrepancy between those. You're comfortable who you are. You, you know, um, it's in line with your beliefs and your values and that of the communities around you. Ego identity will serve to protect individuals in the face of change produced um, by sudden changes in personal or situational factors. The ego identity is a way for an individual to fend off the id drives and realistically incorporate the morals and values of the superego that is consistent with the individual and the community. Having a strong sense of ego identity means having the ability to synthesize different selves into one coherent identity throughout time, creating an inner coherence and sameness. A healthy ego identity is the goal for the so, uh, psychosocial stages of development. Now synthesis, if you don't understand or know what that is, I put the definition below. Um, it's a function of the ego. Um, um, to organize and unify other functions within the personality uh, enables an ind individual to think, feel, and act in a coherent manner. Okay, so it, up at the top, um, it's kind of the same thing: um, who they are and how they act. That's similar. Uh, that has sameness and continuity. Okay, they're not, and and no matter where they are, no matter what comes up or different situation that they might be in, they are. Um, uh, the same, okay. Uh, let's see here. So there's no like, um, you know, uh, acting differently um, in, in a certain situation. Um, they're comfortable who they are and how they are and um, behave in that manner. Okay. So you see how that does, that doesn't just come about. You know, you're not born that way. It has to develop. And the way it develops is through time, through experiences. You learn what you want to be, who you want to be like, and you synthesize all those characteristics into your identity, and you become that person. Okay. Um, so the people you idolize, um, people that raised you, um, the time and place and culture that you're raised in, all this affects who you become as a person. And that is your ego identity. Okay? And synthesis is what brings that all together and creates all that. Okay? 
so that that is what we'll be looking at when we are talking about the stages of development so the first stage basic trust versus mistrust and this is that uh, from birth to one year the resolutions hope um, so when you when you um, hope is what allows you to do the basic trust okay if you don't have hope in yourself and people don't have hope in you there'll be a level of mistrust there um, Erickson writes again if you want if you want to read his book this book's really good identity youth in crisis um, pick it up if you're if you want to know more Eric, Erickson um, <clears throat> so Erickson says a sense of basic trust which is a pervasive attitude towards oneself and the world derived from the experiences of the first year of life by trust I mean an essential truthfulness of others as well as the fundamental sense of one's own trustworthiness the general state of trust furthermore implies not only that one has learned to rely on the sameness and continuity there's those two words again of the outer providers but also that one may trust oneself and the capacity of one's own organs to cope with urges that one and uh, sorry that one is able to consider oneself trustworthy enough so that the providers will not need to be on guard or to leave it must be said however that the amount of trust derived from the earliest infantile experiences does not seem to depend on absolute qu quantities of food or demonstrations of love but rather on the quality of the maternal relationships what? mothers create a sense of trust in their children yeah. by that kind of administration which is its quality combined sensitive care of the baby's individual needs and a firm sense of personal trustworthiness within the trusted framework of the community's lifestyle. Lifestyle is another word that uh, comes up a lot with Erickson. Um, but so trustworthiness, uh, do, you, do I trust myself? Do others trust me? Do I trust my, my hands? Do I trust my, my voice? Um, do I trust my cries? Uh, I have to have a level of trust. And I always think of uh, the Maslow, not Maslow, who did the monkeys? Um, Oh, I can't think of it, but you understand the, 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 who did it? It's going to kill me now. Um, I know it begins with an M. I want to say Maslow, but that's not right. Um, huh. But they, uh, they studied Reese's monkeys and they, they saw the, uh, uh Bulby, uh, attachment to, you know, how they have to have a level of trust the mother provides and they kind of explore outward. I always kind of think about that, um, when reading this. And uh, the, the monkeys that had that trust, they were able to, you know, as long as they had that secure base to come back to, they would, you know, br go further out in the environment, explore more, and then, but they had a place to come back to. Um, the, the monkeys that were not raised in such a way did not feel like uh, they could trust the environment around them. So I always think about that when I talk about the uh, basic trust, mistrust. But you understand that that kind of develops a nice solid foundation when i trust who i am you know the people around me that it's safe and secure um, my body is working the way it should be so i can trust that um, so it kind of sets a good solid foundation for somebody to launch off of okay next stage autonomy versus shame okay uh, this is from one to three years of age uh, the resolution is will in this and in many other ways, um, the still highly dependent child begins to experience his autonomous will. Uh, this stage therefore becomes decisive for the ratio between loving goodwill and hateful self-insistence, between cooperation and willfulness, and between self-expression and compulsive self-restraint or meek compliance. A sense of self-control without loss of self-esteem is the ontogenetic source of a sense of free will. Um, from an unavoidable sense of loss of self-control and the parental over-control comes a lasting propensity for shame and doubt. The psychiatric danger of the stage is he will become obsessed by his own repetitiveness and will want to have everything just so. And only in a given sequence and tempo, his precocious conscience uh, does not let him really get away with anything and he goes through, oh, conscience sorry uh, and he goes through his identity 
uh, crisis, habitually ashamed, apologetic, and afraid to be seen. So autonomy, do it for yourself. You're trusting your organs, your body. People are trusting you. You need to start doing for yourself. You need to start uh, um, making, you know, moves, exploring, uh, doing your own thing. Um, and you can see how that's important. And, and I mean, you go from trust to autonomy. Uh, but if you're ashamed, if you feel ashamed, or if your parents make you feel ashamed for trying to do things on your own, or they're um, over um, overbearing, making you feel like you're ashamed for doing things on your own, I mean, you're gonna develop a um, a lot of doubt, um, and you're not gonna want to be autonomous. Okay, uh, but he does can, he does talk about self esteem here. Self-esteem is really important uh, in the young age, and parents have a big effect on self-esteem. You want your child to explore. You want your child to do new things. You want your child to um, do things on their own. And as a parent, you want to praise that. You want to build up that self-esteem that, hey, it's okay to do things on your own. Figure things out. Okay. So it goes from trust to autonomy or mistrust and shame. Okay. Um, Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> what are they going for that? Um, so it goes from basic trust to mistrust to autonomy versus shame. Okay. And next step, or next uh, uh, stage, initiative versus guilt. Okay. This is from three to six years of old, uh, six years of age. The resolution is purpose. Now, the resolution means that they resolve that stage and they are initiative. Okay. If they don't find the resolution, guilt. Okay. Uh, let's see, Erickson the, uh, said that the three developments support this stage while also serving to bring about its crisis. The child learns, number one, the child learns to move around more freely and more violently and therefore establishes a wider and, to him, unlimited radius, radius of goals. Two, his sense of language becomes perfected to the point where he understands and can ask excessively about innumerable things. And they do. They love questions. <laughs> um, number three, both language and locomotion permit him to expand his imagination uh, to so many roles that he cannot avoid frightening himself with what he himself has dreamed and thought of. Nevertheless, out of all this, he must emerge with a sense of initiative uh, as a basis for a realistic sense of ambition and purpose. For again, the pathological consequences of the stage may not show up until much later, when conflicts over initiative may find expression in hysterical denial or in self-restriction, which keeps an individual from living up to their inner capacities or to the powers of his imagination and feeling. And last one, the in indispensable contribution of the initiative stage at later de um, of later identity development then, obviously is that of freeing the child's initiative and sense of purpose for adult tasks which promise, but not guarantee, a fulfillment of one's range of capacities. This is prepared in the firmly established, steadily growing conviction, undaunted by guilt, that I am what I can imagine I will be. Okay. It is equally obvious, however, that a widespread disappointment of this conviction by a discrepancy between infantile ideals and adolescent reality can only lead to an unleashing of the guilt and violence cycle as characteristics of man and yet so dangerous to his very existence. So purpose is really important. So you're, you're and I don't, I don't know, uh, I mean, I think three to six years of age, I don't know if they're... Um, I don't know if there is if it's a little premature to start looking at your purpose but I guess it's important to know your purpose um, or even your role in, in life um, at six years of age uh, I think you start understanding uh, maybe your purpose for being here um, but it's important to have initiative and I think when you have that trust and you have that autonomy and you're comfortable you start taking initiative. You don't have to wait for, you know, your parent to say so. You feel confident in yourself. You have self-esteem. You feel good. You start taking initiative on things. You start doing things without being told. You already know what's uh, what's required of you. Okay. 
So maybe that's your purpose, is doing what you're required of. Um, so, yeah, that's initiative versus guilt. Next one, in industry versus inferiority. This is from six to 12 years of age. And the resolution is competence. I am what I can learn to make work. Um, he is eager to make things together, to share in constructing and planning, instead of trying to coerce other children or provoke restriction. Children now also attach themselves to teachers and parents of other children and they want to watch and imitate people represent occupations which they can grasp. Firemen, policemen, gardeners, plumbers, and garbage men. While all children at times need to be left alone in solitary play, or later in the company of books and radio, motion pictures, and television, um, and while all children need their hours and days of make-believe and games, they all sooner or later become dissatisfied and disgruntled without a sense of being able to make things and make them well and even perfectively. It is this that I have called a sense of industry. Without this, even the best entertained child soon acts exploited. It is as if he knows, and his society knows, and now that he is psychologically already a rudiment, rudimentary parent, he must begin to be something of a worker and potential provider before becoming a biological parent. So six to twelve year olds, uh, I, I mean, I, I think six year olds definitely uh, they they try on a lift different roles, um, but by twelve years of age, Erickson um, thinks you know these adolescent kids um, are starting to prepare themselves for you know um, being a a parent, being a worker, contributing to society, being like everybody else, being what they see. The danger at this stage is the development of the estrangement from himself and from his task, the well-known sense of inferiority. This may be caused by an insufficient solution of the preceding conflict. The child may still want his mommy more than knowledge. He may still prefer to be a baby at home rather than a big child in school. He still compares himself with his father, and the comparison arouses a sense of guilt as well as a sense of inferiority. Family life may not have prepared him for school life, or school life may fail to sustain the promises of earlier stages, and that nothing that he has learned to do well so far seems to count with his fellows or his teachers. Therefore, the configurations of culture and the manipulations basic to the prevailing technology must reach meaningfully into school life, supporting in every child a feeling of competence that is, the free exercise of dexterity and intelligence in the completion of serious tasks unimpaired by an infantile sense of inferiority. This is the lasting basis for a cooperative participation in productive adult life. Whew, a lot of words. A lot of big words. <laughs> um, but industry versus inferior, inferiority, it's so hard for me to say. I don't know why. Um, I, it's very important, and I think industry is it's just starting to like figure out like what you want to do with your life you know um you're, you're starting to feel like you're 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 going towards a different uh, a certain way you know whether it's art science math you know whatever um whatever you're you're wanting to do you know you're starting to look at um, um what you need to get to that to be that person i guess um I'm starting. I'm, I'm always thinking about like the the synthesis of okay, if, if I'm in school uh, and I want to be, uh, let's say, a coach, a high school coach, what types of personality traits? What how do I need to act? Like how do I look? You know, all these tif different types of things you kind of have to take on and and synthesize into your own identity. Okay, um, but also competence. You know, you have to be good at what you do. So, let's see. Let me, uh, let me move on. I had a couple more things to say, but I can't think of them. Identity versus confusion. I'm 12 to 19 years old. Resolution is fidelity. Um, they are sometimes morbidly, often curiously, preoccupied with what they appear to be in the eyes of others as compared with what they feel they are 
And with the question of how to connect with the roles and skills cultivated earlier in the ideal prototypes of the day. So prototypes is another word you'll, you'll hear a lot from Erickson. Prototypes are uh, the traits of the person that you want to be like. Okay. Um, I know there was an example in the book about a military person. That's a prototype. You know, what types of traits would you take on? Um, you know, certainly, you know, um, punctuality, um, you know, um, being respectful of others. I mean, whatever, like whatever you think that prototype is, that's what you're going to try to be. That's what you're going to try to imitate. So identity versus confusion. Let's see, let me move on. Second point, in their search for a new sense of community and sameness, uh, which must now include sexual maturity, some adolescents have to come to grips again with the crisis of earlier years before they can install lasting idols and ideals as guardians of a final identity. They need, above all, a moratorium on the integration of the identity elements ascribed in the foregoing to the childhood stages. Only that now larger unit, vague in its outline and yet immediate in its demands, replaces the childhood milieu, society. Who I think I might have. Uh, I don't know why I put that in there. I'm sorry. I I, I might have to think that one through. Uh, again, Erickson and and Jung and some of these older writers are really abstract and. Um, requires a lot of thinking. <laughs> uh, so I think I might have messed up. I think I might have put that uh, or cut cut that from a different sentence. I don't know. Uh, the estrangement at this stage is ego identity confusion, where such a dilemma is based on a strong previous doubt of one's ethnic and sexual identity, or where role confusion joins a hopelessness of long-standing. Delinquent and borderline psychotic episodes are not uncommon. In general, it is the ability to settle on an occupational identity, which most disturbs young people. To keep themselves together, they temporarily over-identify with the heroes of cliques and crowds to the point of an, apparent, of an apparently complete loss of individuality. Okay? That's part of the confusion. Um, so the last two points are confusion. Identity, uh, again, it's, it's, it's looking at the traits at the behaviors, about uh, the um, like how they act, uh, what they think. It's it's taking that prototype and becoming yourself. You know, bringing all that into who you are. That's creating your identity. Uh, if you wanted to be a therapist, what types of traits do you need to be that therapist? You know, um, how are they? You know, what do they do? How do they act? You know, that type of thing. So that's create part of your identity. And then, you know, again, as time changes, as your environment changes, as you're, you know, you act the same because you, um, you synthesize all these traits and to become who you are. You know? So everything else changes, but you don't. The next one, intimacy versus isolation. This is from 20, 25 years of age. The resolution is love. We are what we love. The first of these is the crisis of intimacy. It is only when identity formation is well on its way that true intimacy, which is a, really a counterpointing, as well as a fusing of identities, is possible. The youth who is not sure of his identity shies away from interpersonal intimacy or throws himself into acts of intimacy which are promis promiscuous, without true fat fusion or real self-abandon. Um, he may settle on highly stereotyped interpersonal relations and come to retain a deep sense of isolation. The counterpoint of intimacy is dis distanceization, the readiness to repudiate, isolate, and if necessary, destroy these forces and people whose ascents seem dangerous to one's own. Thus, the lasting consequence of a need for dis dis distanciation is the readiness to fortify one's territory of intimacy and solidarity and to view all outsiders with a fanatic over-evaluation of small differences between the familiar and the foreign. Whew. Man, there's a lot of, a lot of words here. Uh, so intimacy, uh, if you feel comfortable who you are, uh, you're comfortable in relationships, you tend to find love. When you're isolating, um, you don't want uh, people that aren't familiar um, in your life. 
you tend to cling to the usual. Um, so, yeah, isolation. Okay. Yeah, general, general activity and versus stagnation. This is from 26 to 64 years age. The re resolution is care. Evolution has made man a teaching as well as a learning animal, for dependency and maturation are reciprocal. Mature man needs to be needed. Maturity is guided by the nature of what must, uh, of that which must be cared for. General activity, generativity, yeah. Then it is primarily the concern of establishing and guiding the next generation. The concept of general activity uh, is meant to include productivity and creativity. Neither of which, however, can replace it as destinations of a crisis in development. Where such enrichment fails altogether, pervading sense of stagnation, boredom, and interpersonal impoverishment, individuals then often begin to indulge themselves as if they were their own or one another's own, I'm sorry, of their own or one another's one and only child, and where conditions favor it. Early invalidism, physical or psychological, becomes the vehicle of self-concern. General activity, generativity, I keep the want to throw that L in there. Generativity is itself a driving power in human organization. And the stages of childhood and adulthood are a system of generation and regeneration in which institutions such as shared households and divided labor strive to give continuity. Thus, the basic strengths enumerated here in the essentials of an organized human community have evolved together as an attempt to establish a set of proven methods and to fund a traditional reassurance which enables each generation to meet the needs of the next in relative independence from personal differences and changing conditions. Okay. Try to teach the next generation. Okay. You have developed your identity. You know what it means to be whoever you are. You know how to be, how to act. You know how to view things, how to handle situations, um, all that. And you're trying to pass that on to the next generation, uh, just to maintain that institution. So if you're a uh, accountant, you know, and maybe your son wants to be an accountant, or maybe you just, uh, you know, people out of college, uh, you're training them, you're showing them this is how you be, this is what you do. Um, so I think it involves your work, but also at home when you have kids, you know, you, you're constantly teaching them and showing them how to, you know, not make the same mistakes you made. Okay, so it's passing on all that that knowledge and, and identity that you formed. Okay, um, integrity versus despair. This is the last one. This is from sixty-five years till death. Resolution, wisdom. I am what survives me. In the aging person who has taken care of things and people and has adapted himself to the triumphs and disappointments of being, by necessity, by necessity, the originator of others and the generator of things and ideas, only in him the fruit of the seven stages gradually ripens. It is the acceptance of one's one and only life cycle and of the people who have become significant to it or something that had to be and that by necessity permitted no substitution. Although aware of the relativity of all the various lifestyles which have given meaning to human striving, the possessor of integrity is ready to defend the dignity of his own lifestyle against all physical and economic threats. For he knows that an individual life cycle with but one segment of history, and that for him all human integrity stands and falls with the one style of integrity of which he partakes. Evidence suggests that the lack of loss of the accrued ego integration is signified by disgust and by despair. Fate is not accepted as the frame of life. Death not as its finite boundary. Despair expresses the feeling that time is short, too short, for the attempt to start another life and to try out alternative roads to integrity. Such despair is often hidden behind a show of disgust. A, mis a misanthropy, man, <laughs> uh, or a chronic contemptuous displeasure with particular institutions and particular people. A disgust 
and a displeasure which we're not allowed allied uh, with the vision of a superior life only signify the individual's contempt for himself it's not really a place i would want to be especially at 65 years old that must be really hard uh to to live and feel that way about your life so so integrity versus despair this is what the other seven steps lead up to if you complete the seven uh, 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 stages and you reach all the resolutions, this is where you'll end up in integrity. You'll look back at your life as full. I am who I, I want it to be. You know, I have all the characteristics. Um, I'm happy with who I am and what I've done with life. And I pass that down to the next generation and you know, I've completed my life cycle. Okay. And last, in conclusion, these are just a couple quotes from Erickson. Uh, from the stages of life, then, such dispositions of faith, willpower, purposefulness, okay, he's going through the stages here, competence, fidelity, love, care, wisdom, all criteria for vital individual strength, also flow into the life of institutions. Without them, institutions will. But without the spirit of institutions pervading the patterns of care and love, instruction and training, no strength could emerge from the sequence of generations. That's interesting. Uh, when I read that, I thought it was really interesting because if our institutions in which you know are, are all around us, um, if we're not who we are, they aren't what they are. So if we if we go away, they go away. If we don't uphold the integrity of ourselves, the integrity of the institutions won't be there. So it's kind of interesting, uh, him writing that. And I thought that was uh, a very good point that he made. So if we don't have e strong ego identities, you know, if a whole generation of kids grew up with, uh, with no ego identity, the, the institution in which they grew up in, it's going to deteriorate. Okay. And... The future generations are not going to be able to um, um, have ego identity either because it's like the institution and the individual, they kind of relate to each other. Okay. Uh, psychosocial strength, we conclude, depends on a total process which regulates individual life cycles. The sequence of, gen the sequence of generations and the structure of society simultaneously for all three levels, for all three have evolved together. So that's, I guess that's what I was kind of saying is uh, the institutions that we're a part of, who we are, uh, it, it's, we're all evolving together. We're all making things better. You know, science is built on, um, you know, um, research. You know, it's built on top of research. New research comes out, new research built on top of that. So it's it's like they all evolve together, and then you know as research is being better, the scientists are getting better and creating new ways of doing science, and it's just it like they improve one another. Uh, they are constantly evolving to improve, but if the person stops improving and uh, doesn't have a good ego identity, then the institution that they're a part of is not going to be good either. So it's like. You know, if you're good, that'll bleed out into your community and with your family and everywhere else. Okay, so um, that's so that was uh, the stages of. Um, let's see here. Let's go back. The stages of psychosocial stages of development. So we're developing ego identity. We need to trust in ourselves and the environment we're in. We need to be autonomous. We have to have the willpower to do for ourselves and the self-esteem to say, hey, you know, you, you can do it. You know, you're you're smart, you're um, capable. So, you know, go ahead. We need to take initiative. Uh, we need to start doing things for ourselves. We need to uh, start making our own decisions. As parents, we want to always praise our kids when they make their own decisions. But also they have consequences of those decisions. You know, they need to figure out what's right and wrong. Of course, that's where morality comes from. Uh, so you want to have, you want to take initiative, industrious, you want to start building yourself, um, building skills, um, putting things together, doing things on your own, creating, uh, 
uh, and getting better at something. That's where usually when school, like a lot of school comes comes into play there, where you're you know you're building confidence in writing, reading, you know arithmetic, identity uh, uh, versus confusion. Again, you, you want to build identity. You want to um, look at your like the people you you want to be like and pick up what they do and pick up who they are and kind of uh, match their that prototype intimacy you know that's uh you know we we are what we love you know uh getting into a, a interpersonal relationship um having uh, relationships that are important because that's what life's all about is the relationships you have um, so definitely important i don't know how isolation that must be you know a hard however way to live uh general activity giving back and then integrity, uh, yeah, loving the life you have, being being proud of who you are. Okay, so those are the those are the stages of development. Um, so let me know if you if, if maybe I got one wrong or what you think about them. If you have anything to comment, please comment below. Please subscribe. Uh, I try to do more of these these classic psych, even though some of them are kind of tough, uh, especially with these psychoanalytic types. <laughs> They always want to be so abstract. Uh, so I, I'm not a classically psychoanalytically trained. Um, I am a professional counselor. I prefer the more cognitive behavioral type stuff. It just makes more sense to me. But I do love reading um, the older theorists, Freud, Jung, Adler, Erickson. Um, I think they had um, a lot of good ideas. And, and this... You know, especially today in 2020, you know, we see, I think, a lot of these stages that are just not being played out, especially, I think, identity is a big one right now. Um, so I, I, I do I do like his work, and I, I really enjoyed reading his book. So um, that's all I have, though. Uh, please like and subscribe. I, I uh, If you have any comments, I love, love comments and uh, want to talk to you. So please uh, let me know what you think. All right. Well, thank you so much, and you have a good day.